Okay, welcome back. It's Mr. Beals. Today we're going to look at covalent bonding. I'm going to start off with an introduction and then we'll move into Lewis structures and then um, naming molecules, naming acids, and then finally we will end with the last two videos on molecular structures and then determining polarity and intermolecular forces after we've got those structures. Now covalent bonding is important and it seems like it's one of those areas where people tend to fall off of the bus. And if you can't get down um, the important aspects of covalent bonding, namely understanding how to name them and what the names mean, and then being able to draw the Lewis structures for them, it makes chemistry all that much more difficult. So everything I'm going to show you in the sequence of videos are the things that I've found to be most helpful with students in learning this topic and also remembering it for the long term because it is something that you will encounter all the way through chemistry. So let's get started with an introduction to covalent bonding. Probably uh, what we need to understand before we dive in too much is why do atoms even bond? Now I have gone over um, ionic bonding in some earlier videos, so if you need to go back and refresh on ionic bonding, again why do atoms bond in a different bond, you can go back and find those. But the rules still apply. Um, atoms are always trying to meet the octet rule, oct meaning eight, so they're always trying to get eight electrons in their outermost shell. And another name for outermost shell is their valence shell. We're pretty much only going to deal with the valence shell because that's the outermost shell that interacts with other electrons and other valence shells. So um, we really only need to understand the valence electrons. I'll explain that coming up. Now, there are two atoms that um, only need to have two electrons in their outermost valence shell. That's hydrogen and helium. And helium is a noble gas, so it's not going to bond to anything. So hydrogen is our sort of one exception to this octet rule. Every element on the periodic table, and again, there are some exceptions to even this, but you'll learn those um, if you continue on in chemistry. But let's just keep with the basics, is that they're all trying to achieve the octet rule, except for hydrogen. Hydrogen is happy with two valence electrons, but all the rest of them are trying to get eight in the outermost shell. So this is why atoms bond. I've got hydrogen down here showing one valence shell electron, and then I've got oxygen as well. Now, oxygen has eight valence electrons, but if you remember from earlier lessons, that two of those fit in the first energy level, and um, that means there's six left that would go into the next energy level, and that next energy level is not full, so that is the outermost level, and that is where the valence electrons live, and if you count those up, you'll see there are six on there. So oxygen has six valence electrons, hydrogen has one. Well, how do we determine this? If you don't have a periodic table at this point, you definitely need to get one. The one I'm using here is um, straight from Wikipedia Commons, one that you can print off, one that you can share, and um, this is your ultimate cheat sheet in chemistry. So if we look at this, this tells us how many valence electrons each of these have. Now, these are called the groups, so going down this direction, this is a group. We've got lots of group, 18 of them across the periodic table. And this first group here, group 1 or 1A, they all have one valence electron. Group 2, they have two. And from previous lessons, these are the transition elements here in the Grand Canyon. We're going to leave those alone for now. And we're going to jump all the way across the other side of the Grand Canyon over here. And in, <coughs> excuse me, in group 13, they have three, four, five, six, seven, and the noble gases over here have eight valence electrons. So all you have to do is remember their location on the periodic table, and you now know how many valence electrons they have. So let me get rid of some of this. And when we're looking at Lewis structures, which I'm going to show you plenty more of them, for hydrogen here, we'll just take one from each group, hydrogen, that we now know, has one valence electron. So I show one electron, if it'll show up on there, on hydrogen. If I go to beryllium, so we'll just move our way across the groups, beryllium has two, so two valence electrons, and I'm going to show them on opposite sides, and you'll see why later on, um, or if you've watched some of the previous videos, that because of some rules, which you can go back and find out about, they, they don't pair up until later on. So let's jump all the way across to boron, um, boron has some weird exceptions. We won't get into those, but it has three valence electrons. Carbon has four. One, two, three, 
four. Um, nitrogen has five. One, two, three, four. Now notice, we draw these sort of in like the compass rows at the top, the side, the bottom, and the other side. Um, and they don't pair up until you have enough to pair up. So notice carbon back here. I've got a bit of a mess, I apologize, but um, carbon has four electrons around it. One, two, three, four, and none of them are paired. Compare that to nitrogen here, where now we have five electrons. So this nitrogen, when we draw it Lewis dot structure, has a pair up here. The pairs are important because that pair right there is not going to bond with anything else. The areas where there are no pairs, for example, right here, 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 and here on carbon, those would like to have a pair. Remember, we're trying to get to eight valence electrons. So carbon is going to pair up with other things so that it can share electrons and have eight valence electrons. Now nitrogen would like to have one more here, one more here, and one more here. So it's going to bond with three other things um, in order to achieve that. Again, let me get rid of some of this, and I'll just show you the last two. So we've got nitrogen, oxygen, um, oxygen, you're going to see has six, so one, two, three, four, and now we have to start pairing them up, five, six. So oxygen, according to what we just said, is going to make two bonds so that it can share an electron here and share an electron here, and then it would have eight in its outermost shell. And then finally over here, fluorine, fluorine right here is going to have seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And if we go back to why that would bond, there's room for one more electron there that it's going to bond with. Now if that doesn't make sense, it should in the next couple of slides when I start. Um, well, let's just clear that off and we'll go to the next slide. So, Ionic bonds, again, we covered this a while back, but ionic bonds, they either gave away or they stole electrons from somebody else. And that all depends on their electronegativity. So they become positive if they lose an electron, or they become negative if they steal an electron from somebody else. So I'm not going to cover those things because we're moving on to covalent bonds. Covalent bonds don't steal from each other. They share. So we're going to be combining these instead of looking at that electrostatic force that forms through the stealing of ionic. We're just going to share in these lessons. So, let's start with water. Water is pretty understandable. We've got H2O, um, so I'll use this for an example for s several things. In a covalent bond, again, atoms share electrons, and atoms like to have the maximum number of electrons in their valence shell for all of them on the periodic table. That would be eight, except for hydrogen, which only needs two. And that's because it doesn't have enough room to fit eight around it. So elements will combine until they fill up their shells, their outermost shells. So how many electrons does hydrogen have in its outermost shell when it's all by itself? It has one because it's in group one on the periodic table. Oxygen has six because it's in group six on the periodic table. Um, again, in, in the periodic table, depending on which periodic table you have, can be numbered one through 18. Um, if you go by the, the group numbers that I showed you on the, on the last slide, that's an easier way, I think, to remember how many valence electrons it has. So here we've got oxygen. It does have eight total, but only six of them in, are in the outermost shell. And when we're looking at bonding, all we care about is the outermost shell or the valence electrons. So in water, we've got a hydrogen. We've got our oxygen. Obviously, this oxygen would like to have uh, more valence electrons around it. So it says, hey, I'm going to need two hydrogens to come over and share their one electron with me, and then I will have eight in my outermost shell, and hydrogen, you will have enough in your outermost shell. So at this point, hydrogen now has two in its outermost shell, and this hydrogen has two, this hydrogen has two, and the oxygen, if you count them up all the way around, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, all the way around the outside. So oxygen now has eight. Each of these hydrogens have two, and everybody's happy. So this is why they bond. Um, the reaction for making water, again, we're going to move into this, looking at covalent bonding and how these form and the reaction that happens when things combine together. 
Um, so you've got hydrogen and oxygen, both of which are diatomic molecules. You'll see that in a couple slides to form water. Now that top equation doesn't add up. So if you look at the bottom one, it adds up a little better. Again, this is a later lesson, but you've got two hydrogens meeting with two oxygens to make two water molecules, which releases a whole bunch of heat and light. And I've got a video of this demonstration. I'll put the link to it down there at the bottom um, once that video uploads to YouTube, but showing how hydrogen reacts with oxygen in this um, reaction to re reduce or to release heat and light. So, what's the difference <coughs> excuse me, between ionic bonding and covalent bonding? Well, ionic bonding, um, and this is sort of generalized, but ionic bonding is more or less stealing electrons. Covalent bonding is sharing. So the differences between those, um, one of the things we're really going to have to look at is electronegativity. Now I've added a whole bunch of extra information down here and down here about each of these. And so if that's information that you need, go ahead and just pause this and you can write those things down. One important thing here is in ionic bonding, generally they the elements um, that make the bond are found on opposite sides of the periodic table, whereas covalent bonding, they're found close together. Okay, and that has to do with electronegativity. Their properties are listed on there as well, and then also how it works. I'm going to get into the naming for covalent bonding in a bit, so I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time with that. Okay, here's one important thing before we move on. They're called diatomic molecules. You've got to memorize these, or if you've got a periodic table and you're allowed to use it, you must memorize the location of these. Now, diatomic molecules are two atom molecules that are held together by covalent bonds. So diatomic, two atom molecules. Molecule is a term for something that's held together by a covalent bond. Let's look at fluorine real quick before we jump into where do all of these live on the periodic table. So fluorine has seven valence electrons because it's in group 7a um, or group 17 depending on how you look at this which means fluorine has seven valence electrons and because it has seven valence electrons if it comes into contact or near another fluorine those two fluorines can just combine together and that makes F2 or fluorine gas this is a diatomic molecule a two atom molecule. Now there are some on the periodic table that always exist as diatomic molecules unless they're attached to something else. So how do I find these? The diatomic molecules and again you just gotta memorize these or at least where they're at on the periodic table. Here is a list of the diatomics, the ones that are always attached to themselves or attached to something else. So hydrogen doesn't live by itself. Now hydrogen ion in solution is going to make an acid. So that's something a little bit different and I've got lessons about acids as well. But let's just look at these in the terms of covalent bonding. So hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine are the diatomic molecules and there are seven of them. I think the easiest way to remember these is if you look at the shape of this over here, this makes sort of the number seven, but there's only one, two, three, four, five, six of them here, and that's because hydrogen lives way over here. So our seven of them make the shape of the seven, and you gotta remember hydrogen's hiding over there. So again, one, two, three, four, five, six of them over here, plus hydrogen makes seven. And those are the diatomics. Now you're definitely going to need to remember the diatomics for later on when we start doing chemical reactions because if you see something like hydrogen gas you need to remember it's not just an H it's H2 so next up in the next video we're gonna look at Lewis structures which is um, I think one of the most difficult concepts um, for some people so some people see this and it makes sense to them right away and some people continue to struggle and struggle and struggle with Lewis structures so I've got a whole bunch of examples and I've got what I think are the easiest sequence of um, rules to do Lewis structures that I've been able to come up with and that's all in the next video so check that one out